In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وصلى الله وسلم على عباده الذين اصطفى وبعد We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى and send blessings and salutations upon the masterpiece Muhammad ibn Abdullah May Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless him and all his family members and may he bless his companions and may he bless every one of us my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, I do apologize for the late arrival this morning. I think partly I need to take the blame. Uh, I did not realize the hospitality of the Malaysians. When I was fed last night, uh, I ate much more than I would normally have eaten. And for that reason, you find it has a skittle effect, where when one goes down, the others all go down. So that resulted in a slight bit of a delay. The brothers were there on time to pick me up, but I was uh, perhaps 15 minutes late. So you can forgive me. I see the large numbers here, and I feel so guilty that I've kept you waiting. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, forgive us all. This morning, I have been asked to speak on a topic connected to our beliefs. We are Muslimin, and we know that Belief is very important. From the very beginning, we have the tenets of belief, and I'm sure you know the difference between what is termed Islam and what is termed Iman. If I were to tell you what are the pillars of Islam, you would tell me that there are five pillars of Islam. And we need to know this. The first is Shahadati Allah ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We know that to bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides the one who made us, and to bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger or the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that he is the worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time, the slave of Allah. The word used is abdun, and abd means a slave, and one of the reasons why the word slave is used is because it shows that he too is a worshipper and he is not part of the worshipped, which means he is not part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can worship him, but we worship Allah alone. The beauty of Islam and what attracts the intellectual Western mind to Islam, and what attracts those who follow other religions to Islam, is the concept of Godhood primarily in Islam. And what that means is, when they are told that we worship our maker alone, no one else, no one else. I put my head on the ground for whoever made me, it appeals. Because now the risk factors are all out. The minute you put your head on the ground for anything else, you are putting your head on the ground for the created and not for the creator. So shaitan's main plan when Adam alayhi salam was created, Shaitan told Allah that I will show you that this man will not worship you. He will worship not only me, but everything besides you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates and dislikes what is called shirk and what is called association of partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why he warns us that, look, even if you are sinful and you have committed a sin, I will forgive you those sins on condition that you have not associated partnership with me. No act of worship in Islam is allowed to be rendered to any, anything or anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the maker. So we read salah, and I'm sure we all know what I'm saying, I'm only repeating it. We read salah, we, we give zakah, all this is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we go for hajj, not to show someone. We go for the sake of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We fast in the month of Ramadan for the sake of Allah. No one fasts to say, you know, I'm fasting for the sake of uh, losing weight. I hope that's not the case. Uh, 
that might be a byproduct, it might be something that you may achieve as a result, but primarily we are fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The same applies if someone says, I am reading salah for exercise, and there are some people who do say that, then they would be wrong. They would be wrong. You might achieve a good body and you might achieve the stretching of your joints and so on. And you might achieve good health through that. But that is not the primary aim. It is a byproduct. I'm calling it byproduct meaning it is something on the side that you have got by the way. For example, uh, you might eat something. Uh, what you achieved is nourishment. What you achieved is nourishment. You have eaten in order to fill your belly. And as a result, you might achieve, depending on what you've eaten, uh, some form of benefit which is over and above what you expected. So we worship none but Allah. Sh Shaitan, he has a plan that he wants to shift and divert people from the worship of Allah to the worship of everything besides Allah. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the prophets to remind us all not to worship the slaves of Allah, but to worship Allah. What that means is, Inna Allah abta'atha Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallama li yukhrija al-ibad min ibadati al-ibadi ila ibadati rabbi al-ibadi. Allah has sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to, to remove the people from worshipping the slaves of Allah to worshipping Allah. Worshipping those who are supposed to be worshipping Allah to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. So it's important we realize this because many people, sometimes small matters occur and they, they tend to render acts of worship to other human beings. You know, you have, for example, and this is something that happens across the globe, we notice it. When there is a very knowledgeable person, when there is a person who is uh, pious sometimes to us, he appears to be a very pious person and so on. Sometimes human, human nature, in fact, it's not actually human nature, but shaitan makes it become human nature, makes one feel that this person is very elevated. There's no harm in feeling that. That's just the starting point. So we respect the person. That respect is very important. But there is a fine line between respect and worship. Very fine line. Sometimes we tend to cross that line without realizing. So to respect someone is our duty. We respect all Muslimin. But to worship a person, it becomes an issue that shaitan gets excited with and he keeps on pushing us forward and forward. So it is important for us to draw a line. When there is a person who has come to you with goodness, they have taught you Islam, you will take the Islam from them and you will respect them, but you will not worship them as a result. You don't worship them. I am sitting here in front of you. Wallahi, I promise you. If I wanted to abuse the fact that people respect me, I could do that. But it would drop my level in the eyes of Allah. People might not know. I can fool them. It's possible. And if you would like, if I allowed it, you may have come to me and you might consider me far higher than what I am. When the Prophet ﷺ himself was instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ Imagine the Quran says this, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell them that I am a human being just like you. I am a human being just like you. The difference between me and you is that revelation comes to me and it does not come to you. So do not worship me, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So much so that Jesus may peace be upon him. Allah says in the Quran and you will find this in a few places but I will read to you one of the verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Isa alayhi salam on the day of Qiyamah. أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَ إِلَى هَيْنِ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ قَالَ سُبْحَانَكَ مَا يَكُونُ لِي أَنْ أَقُولَ مَا لَيْسَ لِي بِحَقُّ Allah says, we will ask the Prophet Jesus on the day of judgment, O oh Jesus, did you tell the people to worship you and your mother and leave me as, as Allah? How could you have told them? Did you say this? And Jesus, may peace be upon him, will say, Ya Allah, glory be to you, all praise is due to you. I did not say anything besides what you instructed me to say. Never ever have I said, worship me. And this is why I open the Bible today. Never does Jesus say, worship me. He doesn't say that. Even in the Bible, even though they've changed it, he doesn't say that. But the people worship 
Jesus because shaitan used the plan. What was the plan? This is the plan. Listen to it. Jesus may peace be upon him was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as you know it is one of the four probabilities. It is actually the third one. The th Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created without male, without female. That is Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. The second, Allah created through a male without the involvement of a female. And that is the Eve or Hawa alayhi salatu wasalam. The third is Allah has created through a female without the involvement of a male. Through a female without the involvement of a male. And that is Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And the last, myself and yourself, we, we are created through male and female. So what happened is, these are the four probabilities. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, and he was sent to man, and he had miracles, he spoke to man from a cradle, and he, he grew up, and he was sent to the people, and he, there were so many things that happened in his life. Later on, he was taken up. When he was taken up, what happened? The people later on, shaitan came to them and told them, that this was the miracle of Allah. That statement is correct. It's a miracle. Even the Quran says the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he was created miraculously. So if he was a miracle of Allah, now shaitan came and said, you know what? That means because he didn't have a father, so Allah is his father. Now look at how shaitan took the people away. He didn't have a father, so Allah is his father. So people started saying, oh, so this is the son of God. So if he is a son of God, he is created from a part of God. Now shaitan is continuing, going further and further. And if he is created from a part of God, then you can call out to him. Why do you want to call out to the father? So they actually say God the father and God the son. God the father and God the son. I had some people come to my house a long time ago. You know, some of the people uh, preaching the Bible and so on. They visit the Muslims also. They visited my house once. And uh, we asked them a few questions. And one of the questions is, look, if Jesus was the son of God because he didn't have a father, according to you Christians, don't you think Adam is more deserving of being a child of God because he neither had a mother nor a father? So there was two of them, they looked at each other. <laughs> and I said, and Eve is the daughter of God. So the one nudges the other and says, yes, 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 they are also the children of God. So I said, so why do you say the only begotten son? And the word begotten for your information is very dirty, very dirty word. It refers to the relation between male and female. May Allah protect us. And we cannot use that word for God Almighty. We consider it very blasphemous, but because we, we, we tolerate those who say that and we disagree with it. We disagree with it, but we tolerate them because it's lakum dinukum waliyadin. That's our policy. Which means you have your deen and we have ours. So you will find that at that point, they have no answer. They had to say, yes, those are also children. So why don't you say that? That look, he's not the only one. There are other two children. So he tells me, and this is a fact. He says, no, you know what? Uh, God Almighty had to expel them from his family because of the sin they committed. They committed a sin. So that's why now they were, you know, disowned basically. So I looked and I said, you are trying to tell me that God also has social problems like we do. <laughs> and marital problems, you know, things with his family that we do. So it does not make sense. Doesn't make sense at all. They cannot answer that. And you know, we might sit and laugh at it, but it is a serious point. That you know, how? If Jesus fits in this way, what about the others? Then they said, no, Jesus is a part of God, so call out to him. <coughs> Calling out to him because he is the son. And when you want to get to the father, you can go through the son. Today, you, if, you do, if you know the son of a minister in Malaysia, <laughs> and you don't know the minister properly, or you know, you think maybe he's a bit too high for you to get to, you just say, hey, can I, what about your dad? You know, can you talk to him and so on? There is a great likelihood that, you know, he will tell his father that, uh, you know, we have this friend of mine and he'd like to meet you. You may get there. That is a simple example of this world. 
You cannot apply that to your maker. My maker and your maker loves me and you equally in the sense that I have equal opportunity that, 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 that you have to get to him. But I need to make sure I get to him. Your opportunity to get to Allah and my opportunity to get to Him is the same. I need to get into sajda, I need to repent to Him and I need to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my link with Him must be direct. This is the beauty of Islam and the difference between Islam and the other religions. Is we get to our maker directly. This is what is inviting the whole world to Islam. Today why are people turning to Islam? Because of the direct link with your maker. That's what people are turning for. You know, I have spoken to people who have reverted from Christianity. And they have said, you know, we have sat in the church and confessed our sins to a man who is more sinful than us. <laughs> and he looks at us and he says, my son, you have been forgiven. <laughs> what is that? Wallahi, how can we, do, can anyone here confess their sins to me? Who am I? I need the mercy of Allah just as much as you do and maybe even more. So we do not confess our sins to anyone but our maker. This is the beauty of Islam. When you've committed a sin, Islam teaches you that you ask Allah, your maker for forgiveness. And for as long as you have admitted your error, for as long as you have regretted the sin, you have asked for forgiveness, promised not to repeat it, those four conditions, your sin is wiped out. If it is between you and your maker, it's gone. It's wiped out. So, how beautiful a deen is it? It's such a beautiful religion. Whereas when it comes to people of this nature, they sometimes don't have an answer. So now you've got to go through someone. So you, you, they have a medium. They, they will use the Prophet Jesus and they will say, no, it's a stepping stone to go to God Almighty. And they say, God the Father, God the Son. In Zimbabwe, we had a true story. True story that occurred. In fact, we were told it later on. But uh, there were floods at a certain stage a few years back. Some floods in some areas. So, you know, the little children, they learn about God the Father, God the Son. They are all confused. Even the priest himself is confused. He cannot explain to you Trinity. <laughs> the Trinity is a point of confusion amongst the Christians. And why we are saying this is because we are talking of our belief today. Look, we disagree with them, but we have tolerated and we, we have to and we will. And we have the right to talk about it amongst ourselves to, to confirm what we are believing. Because we believe this. And this is why if we don't talk about it, there are some of us who might, not even, who might never know what exactly Islam teaches in this regard. So the young boys who were taught this in the church, that you know there is God the Father, there is God the Son, and they ask questions, what do you mean? And they say, just believe there is God the Father, God the Son, and so on. So who do we call out to? Holy Ghost? God the Father, God the Son, what? So they say, no, you call out to God the Son, you just say Lord Jesus and you call out. So then the child was now marooned, marooned meaning caught in, 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 a, in a difficult situation on top of a tree and the water is there and a crocodile comes up and a few crocodiles are coming up and he sees all this and he says, God, God, he's calling out to God to help him. I'm calling out to God the Father. God the Father, I need your help. There are these crocodiles here who'd like to, who, who may attack me just now. And please don't send your son because this is not child's play. <laughs> now, for a small child to say this, to be honest with you, for a little child to say this, it shows that the fitra, the nature of man, refuses this idea. The nature of man, the uncontaminated nature of humankind, will refuse the idea of Father and Son and Holy Ghost and so on. So in Islam, we are so fortunate. The way we have been taught is you and your maker. Your maker, this is what it is. So shaitan used the plan with the Christians and he succeeded to a great degree. And this is why Allah says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثالث those who have said that Allah is a third of three, they have disbelieved. And Allah says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بُنُ مَرْيَمُ Those who have said that Isa, the son of Mary, Jesus, the son of Mary, is God, they have disbelieved in God. And the Quran says, وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ رَبِّي وَرَبَّكُمْ Allah says, yet the Messiah told the people, worship Allah who is my Rabb and your Rabb. That's what the Messiah told the people. And yet they turned away. They had a dispute amongst themselves and they turned away. They started worshipping the Messenger himself 
And in the process, shaitan is so excited. He just wants to laugh at us and laugh at Allah. To say, you see, I told you, these people are not going to worship you. They will worship everything besides you. So now, if you take it a step further, you will find that later on, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent. What a miracle. The best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah has chosen him to come to us. Highest in status. The highest of all messengers. The most beloved unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are fortunate that he was sent to man. And he was sent to, to man in such a way that he was not made from amongst the rich and the haughty and those who were, you know, the, the, the rulers of the age and so on. He was a young man, orphaned at a young age. Orphaned at a young age. And this is a point of comfort to those who have been orphaned. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may, may have chosen you for something greater. It does not mean you are orphaned so you won't achieve. You may achieve something great. So, when he came, his life, his whole life was to be emulated by us. It is called a sunnah. Sunnah meaning whatever he did, whatever he did and taught. There are different categories of what he taught. Some of it is compulsory and so on. But even his life, his dress code, his method, his mannerisms, everything recorded, we should try our best to emulate him because the Quran says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, you have the most beautiful example to emulate in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a human being, you find that he, we have something to emulate. So we read about his goodness, we want to be as good. Or we try to be good. We read about his kindness, we want to be that way. We read about this, we want to be that way. And so because we see how he has been and we try to be as uh, as close as possible as we can to his method and his style. And this is the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he left, some people later on began to fall in the same trap of shaitan. The same trap of shaitan that he used with the Christians. He saw that it worked there. So let us use it again here. So what did he say? He said, you know, this was the best of creation. Yes, we know. So you see how the shaitan starts with something which is correct. It's a statement that is right. There's, there's no doubt. The best of creation. So that means, you see, that if he was the best of creation, Allah loves him the most. He's a part of Allah. Now, how did we get he's a part of Allah from? They said, no, he is created from a part of Allah. We have had Muslims who say this now. That he is created from a part of Allah. And for that reason, we cannot get to Allah directly. We need to go through the messenger. So we start worshipping the Nabi. And people start saying, Ya Nabi. And people start calling out to the Prophet ﷺ. What is the difference between us and the Christians if we do that? What's the difference? We fell in the same trap. Shaitan laughs at us. And Muhammad ﷺ, the Quran is full of warnings to say, Be careful how you worship your maker. Do not associate anyone or anything in partnership with your maker, not even me. Subhanallah. So now you look at the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ one day got up and told his companions, I have a warning for you. What is the warning? Suddenly he comes up and he says, I have a warning for you. لا تطروني كما أطرت النصار ابن مريم ولكن قولوا عبد الله ورسوله You saw what we said moments ago about the Prophet Jesus and how the people elevated him to Godhood and how they started worshipping him as a stepping stone. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, issued a warning. He says, I am warning you. Never cross the limits regarding me the same way that the Christians cross the limits regarding Jesus. May peace be upon him. Look at the statement. Now someone might not know what are the limits of the, uh, Jesus. Because at that time, there were some Christians, but not all of them. There were some Christians and some of the people who had accepted Islam knew. But what you would find is the Prophet وسلم, saying, and ending the statement by saying, وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا عَبْدُ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولُهُ Don't cross the limits and the boundaries with me. In the same way that the Christians have crossed the limits and the boundaries with the Prophet Jesus by starting to worship him and so on. You should always call me Abdullahi wa Rasuluhu. Call me, Abdun means the slave. Call me the slave of Allah. If you are a slave of Allah, you cannot be worshipped. You see, that's why the word Abdun comes in there. A slave of Allah and I am his worshipper. Wa Rasuluhu, I am his messenger. So the slave of Allah, the worshipper of Allah and the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm just a messenger. 
So we, we, we learn a lot from this because when we utter our shahada, the first pillar of Islam that I was talking about at the beginning, we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. There's the hadith. Qulu abdullahi wa rasuluhu. Say abdullahi and rasuluhu. So we say abduhu wa rasuluhu. So we are saying that he is the slave of Allah and we are saying that he is the messenger of Allah. How then can we render an act of worship for him? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the mouth of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to inform us about something grand. قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to all the people, if you love Allah, then follow me. He didn't say worship me. Follow me. I will guide you because I'm a messenger of Allah. Follow me and Allah will love you. And he will forgive your sins. For indeed, he is most forgiving, most merciful. Now, if he wanted, he could have said, If you love Allah, worship me. If you love Allah, come through me. Which means, we, people start putting their head on the ground and in, in their sujood, instead of saying words like, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, they begin to say different words, May Allah protect us. We don't even want to utter these words. And it is happening amongst those who call themselves Muslim. And this is why we decided to talk on belief. We cannot differ on these matters. We have to understand what it's all about. This is what Islam is. And this is why Islam is growing on the globe because of this beauty. If we were to say, no, we are worshipping Muhammad wasallam, well, a Christian would tell you, look, what makes you different from me? I worship Jesus. What's the difference? But ask those who are accepting Islam in their numbers, what is it that is beautiful in this religion? that is making you want to come into it, they will say the concept of Godhood and my direct link with the one who made me, Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters, you have a direct connection with your maker. Use it. The closest that a worshipper can get to his Rabb is when he is in the condition of prostration. So when, we, when our heads are on the ground, we are the closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine, we are saying, Subhana Rabbi al Azim. Glory be to Allah. Rabbi means the one who made me, nourishes, cherishes, sustains, provides, protects, and has absolute control of every aspect of my existence. Glory be to Him. He is the highest. Al-A'la means the highest. And at this moment, my head is on the ground, so I am the lowest. In terms of the positioning. My head is right down and I am confirming that there is... There is the deity that I worship is right at the top, completely high. And I will not render an act of worship for anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why we find the point I made, the issue of respect and worship. We respect people, we respect ulama, we respect a lot of other things, but we do not worship these things. And we do not worship the scholars, we don't worship them. Because shaitan will come and he will continue coming to say, you know what, this person has superpowers, supernatural powers. So what? It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah. If someone has a, as, when we say supernatural power, it depends what, what that means. I know one day I was sitting with a sheikh. And he's a scholar of deen. Someone told me this sheikh can see in your face whether you have wudu or not. <laughs> And they believe this. Today we, we are looking at it and we are talking about it. But there are people who say, no, he has been given the power by Allah to tell whether you have wudu or not. I was shocked. I was quite young at the time. And I was shocked. And I knew the sheikh, you know. So after some time, uh, he, people were sitting with him from the morning. And, you know, later on, time of Dhuhr, he told some people, please go to make wudu. And some others, he left them. He didn't tell them anything. Now, the, the one man is nudging me. He says, you see? You see? So I looked at the sheikh. I said, sheikh, is it true that you know who has wudu and who doesn't have wudu? He said, no, my son. I don't know anything of that nature. That is knowledge of the unseen. And knowledge of the unseen is only with Allah. So I asked him, so how come you told those people to make wudu and you did not tell these people to make wudu? He said, because those people are sitting with me from the morning. These ones just came in a, a few moments ago. <laughs> 
So look, something logical, something logical that is so common sense, but people sitting misunderstood it because shaitan came to them to say, Sheikh is supernatural, supernatural. He can tell you like there is a board, you know, when you have a bus going, it has a sign saying where you are going. So perhaps they have a board saying wudu and no wudu. <laughs> Allah make it easy. We cannot, this is out of a question. Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we want you with your mouth to tell them. This is what Allah says in the Quran. Qul, which means you tell them. La ya'lamu man fi samawati wal ardi al ghayba illa Allah. No one in the skies and the earth, no one knows the unseen besides Allah. If Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us and he did, he did mention to us so many matters of the unseen, it was Allah who gave him that information. But the owner of the knowledge of the unseen is who? It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So none knows it besides Allah. And we have heard this so many times. There are verses of the Quran. And one of the points I have found very, very sad. My beloved brothers and sisters, I want to share it with you. A point I find very, very sad. We are Muslims. We have never understood the Quran. That's what I find. We are guilty. And I, we travel the globe and we look at Muslims in a Muslim country. And you say, brother, have you understood the Quran? He says, no, I recite it. What do you mean recite it? I read. I, I can read Surah Al-Fatiha, Al-Duha, Al-Teen, Al-Alaq, Al-Falaq. You can recite. How do you know the meaning? He says, no, meaning I don't know. <laughs> but I can recite because I need it for my salah. Well, what is your field, my brother? So he will tell you, I'm an accountant. So when you became an accountant, how many books did you read? He will tell you, oh, many books. So your accountancy will help you for how many years? I get a very good job with Ernest and Young. <laughs> so how much are you getting? I'm, I'm getting paid so much. Perhaps, you know, tens of thousands of ringgits, mashallah. And how long will that last for? He says, well, uh, they will retire me at 65. What's retirement age here in Malaysia? 58. Oh, it's come down. I said 65. So now the certificate is valued for less than that even. They've cut out seven years from it. So it will only help you for this many years. And you have read so many books in order for you to work up to the age of 58. And then your retirement package. Have you read one book to prepare you for the life after death? One. One book, main book. My beloved mothers, sisters, brothers, we are guilty. Wallahi, we are guilty. We need to understand. When we understand the pure message of the Quran, it automatically shines. It shines our ornament. And it removes the rust from our acts of worship. Because we will understand what Allah wants from us. That's the Quran. And this is why, you know, the hearts of the believers, they incline towards the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have someone explaining the Quran in simple words, no matter who it is, even the non-Muslims will listen. They will listen. You know, there is a hadith where there were the three leaders of Quraysh in Mecca who quietly used to go. During the daytime, they used to fight Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They used to tell everyone, don't listen to this Quran. Don't listen to this man. He is a magician. He is a madman. He is a womanizer. He wants power. He wants money. They threw so many accusations at him. But at night, they, separately, the one decided, let me, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to read Qur'ans audibly, slightly audibly near where he was. And they used to go around and s quietly. You know, that time the homes were not like this, where I'm talking so loudly the neighbor cannot hear me. <laughs> that time you say something and people can hear you. So they went, one is on this side, the other one that side, and it's dark. That time there were no street lights and so on. They're listening. When he completed his recitation, the three were walking home. Oh, they bumped into each other. I'm talking of leaders, Al-Akhnas ibn Shuraid. The names are there, Abu Jahl. They, they were the leaders of Quraysh. The ones who were fighting Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And what happened? They met on the road. They bumped into each other at night. Hey, what are you doing awake at this time of the night? He says, no, what are you doing awake at this time of the night? The other one says, no, what are you doing awake at this time of the night? So he says, hey, look, you know what? 
Uh, I was, they said, no, 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 no excuse. Tell us what were you doing? And then the three, they admitted, no, you know, the one says, I went to listen to this uh, word to see what, he says, you know what? I went to do the same thing. The third one says, you know what? I did the same thing. So they said, look, we are the leaders. We can't do this. Imagine the sweetness of the Quran pulls the non-Muslims towards it. And sometimes the Muslims themselves are not pulled. Allahu Akbar. In our age. In our age today, Muslims themselves, they just say, no, this book is there to read. And just you must recite every morning as an ornament. Pick it up and read Surah Al-Fatiha and read Surah Al this and that. And just close it and put it away. We have not understood its meaning. We don't know its message. But ask them about Harry Potter. They will give you all five versions. And they will tell you, we hope there was a sixth one. Yes, it's happening. Quran, compare it to the other books. What are we going to tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So now you have the, the, the issues of belief that are mentioned in the Quran. How are we going to know them if we haven't even understood the pure message of the Quran? So to, to end that story, they, they promised the three of them that we are not going to return. The next day they were there, all three, same thing happened. <laughs> the third day they were there, same thing happened. Then they said no, no. Then they started swearing oaths and after that they didn't come. Also one day they sent one of the, 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 the leaders of Quraysh to Muhammad وسلم, to say, you know what, just leave your statement. What is it? Leave your statement. You want to marry women? We will give you the most beautiful of women. You want wealth? We give you wealth. You want to be the leader? We make you our leader. You, what do you want? Whatever you want, we give it to you. But stop saying all this. Stop talking about our idols. Stop telling people to worship Allah alone and you know the maker and all that. They believed in Allah. The kuffar of Quraysh believed in Allah. The kuffar of Quraysh believed in Allah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some people might say no. The Quran says, وَلَئِن سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ If you were to ask the kuffar, who created the skies and the earth? They won't say, my idol. Because they know the idol, I just made it now, now. <laughs> they know. They will say, there is a maker. Allah created that. And Allah says in the Quran, فَإِذَا رَكِبُوا فِي الْفُلْكِ دَعَوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ إِذَا هُمْ يُشْرِكُونَ Whenever they were in the water, on the ship, and the ship was rocking a bit, they said, oh my maker, help us, help us here. They didn't say, oh my idol. They know the idol sometimes was made of dates. The other day I mentioned Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Later on he used to laugh. He says, you know, I made an idol of dates. And one day I was hungry asking the idol, I need food. And the, the food didn't come, so I ate the idol. <laughs> yes. So when that happens, they don't, they know the idol cannot help me. The idol cannot help me. In fact, if there is weight in the ship and they need to kick something out, the first thing they throw is the idols. <laughs> so when they are in the ship, they call Allah, they call out to their maker, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save them. The minute they dock on the coast, they immediately begin to call their idols again. This is foolishness. It happens to us, those of us who've traveled by ship, sometimes it happens where when it rocks heavily, we start saying, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illa wa Ashhadu Anna Muhammadan Abduhur. We are saying it with so much passion because of the difficulty. May Allah make us say it every day with passion. I mean, sometimes in the aircraft, I was coming now to Malaysia, we had a lot of turbulence, mashallah. A lot of turbulence. I know how it feels, and I'm sure some of you do too. When you, you say, Ya Allah, forgive me if this is my Ya Allah, take care of my children. <laughs> ya Allah, you mean it clearly. Ya Allah, take care of me. If you have decided for us to go, Ya Allah, I have children, I have left behind, I have this, I have that. Ya Allah, take care of them, give them barakah, give them. It happens. Once you land, first thing we, we hit the scenes, mashallah. We go here, go there. We forget what happened there. If that was the case, it would be good for us to stay on an aircraft throughout our lives. <laughs> So let us not fall prey to this matter where we know Allah, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but only at certain points we have a high and certain points we, have, we, we forget Him totally. Getting back to this issue, we know the pillars of Islam. I have just mentioned them. The first one, shahadati Allah ilaha illallah, wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. We know that. Then we have iqam is salati wa ita is zakati wa sawmi ramadan wa hajjil bayt man istata'a ilayhi sabilan. I'm sure we all understand that, don't we? We all understand. These are the five pillars of Islam. 
So what are the pillars of Iman? We believe in Allah. Which means, antu'mina billahi. We believe in Allah. Belief is something you cannot see. This is the thing. So if someone says, are you a Muslim? You could be a Muslim, but are you a mu'min? That I can't tell. A Muslim is a submitter. قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Allah makes mention of this in Surah Al-Hujurat that the Bedouins, they said, we are mu'min, we believe. So Allah says, tell them, don't say we believe. Say we have submitted because Iman has not yet got into your heart. So this shows us, this verse shows us the difference between Islam and Iman. Islam, when we speak about the two of them together, we are saying Islam, the actions, you can see. Look, the five pillars. If someone is uttering the shahada, we can see it. If someone is fulfilling salah, we can see it. If someone is abstaining from food, we can see it. If someone is giving zakah, it, is, it can be seen. If someone is going for hajj, it can be seen. But now let's go to the pillars of iman. If someone tells you, I believe in Allah, can you see it? You cannot see it. Someone says, I believe in the angels. It is in the heart. You cannot see it. I believe in all the previous books. It's in the heart. I cannot see it. I believe in all the messengers. It's in the heart. I cannot see it. I believe that good and bad fate is from the Almighty. It's in the heart. I believe in a resurrection and the fact that I am answerable for everything I do. And I believe in the last day. We cannot see that. So this is why it's important for us to develop that belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there is a very, very interesting point. When it comes to Islam, where do I get it from? When it comes to Iman, where do I get it from? Where can I get it from? Who brought Islam and Iman to me? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did he come with? He came with the Quran. Is the Quran doubted by anyone? The answer is no. For your information, for your information, the whole world admits, and they know it deep down, that the Quran is the only book in existence that has lasted so many years and is uncontaminated. So for this reason, they cannot pick on it. The other day someone asked me, what makes you believe Islam is true? Oh, I have a whole encyclopedia of answers for you, my brother. But I will just say one thing. It's book, done. It's book cannot be competed with. Nothing. Finished. I, I, I can answer them in 50 ways, but let's start with something. And he was stumped, completely stumped, mid-wicket. You know when you, they play cricket, they say, when you know how to bowl, the middle-wicket goes. And you say, oh, the batsman looks back and says, it's gone. So he was stumped mid-wicket. He didn't know what to say. I said, it's book. Because he knows now, as a Christian, he was a Christian. He knows that the book is, the Christians themselves have discrepancies. There are more than 36 versions of the Bible. And the, all the other books have been changed. There are disputes amongst them as to this, as to that. Come to the Quran. So, some time later, he got back to me and he emailed me and told me, you know what, I read that the Quran is not authentic. I told him, my brother, keep on dreaming. This, what you have said is only a trial of the jealous who don't want to accept the truth, saying it's not authentic. How can a book last so many years through billions of people who have crossed? If today there are two billion Muslims, remember how many have passed away? Probably trillions, somewhere. If billions of Muslims have come with this book, they have read it, they have preserved it, they have passed it down generations without a change. I, being born and brought up in one corner of Africa, when I go to Makkah in the Haram, I know the Quran they are reading. I understand, I relate it. I can correct that Imam if anything goes wrong. I know it. And the same applies. If you enter the masjid in Malaysia or anywhere else, if I enter, I cannot speak Malaysian language. The only thing I know is when I came here and I told the people, oh, I like Malaysia. The one brother told me, don't say Malaysia. You must say Malaysia. <laughs> so I said, okay, I will say Malaysia from now on. I think that there is Tajweed also required when it comes. <laughs> so
So if I come to Malaysia, I, I cannot understand the language. I cannot pronounce the, the way you pronounce. But go to the masjid, I will understand, I will enjoy the salah behind the imam. Because I know, subhanallah, what he's reading is, is the miracle of the age. Allahu Akbar Kabira. Allahu Akbar. How fortunate are we? So today people are trying to look for, for, for issues. They say, how could Ruthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu burn those Qur'ans? That's one point they are raising. How could we believe that whatever he did was valid? Today we have the Qur'an, we are sitting here. Then the, another thing they raise about our own belief regarding the Qur'an, they say, why is it that at that time they, did, they gathered the Qur'an only later on? Let me explain to you, you need to know the answer. Why did they gather the Qur'an later on? At that time, the people could barely read or write. Their memories were like elephants. They had powerful memories. So powerful, the Arabs are known for their eloquency. And at that time, their memories were so solid that they relied on the memories more than anything else. If someone said something by memory, it was, it was more valid than anything. They had no need to write things down. And a lot of them could not read or write. هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوَ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ Allah says, it is Allah who sent amongst those who were unlettered. Majority of them were unlettered. Amongst those who were unlettered, Allah sent one from amongst them, one from amongst them to recite the verses to them, to read. Allah didn't say to write them down for them. Because this tilawa is more important. Today we have Hufad. Amongst four or five of us Hufad, we can come up with a Quran that we will be 100% sure there is no mistake in. Just amongst four people. Even less. So tell me the group of the Sahaba. Today, 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 four people. What about the Sahaba anhum, when so many of them gathered? What are we saying? That they, they made mistakes? You see the common logic? Tell the people, let's in Mal choose any city in the world and tell them we want four of your strongest huffad. Bring them here and bring them there. Then let's talk. Now compare them to the level of the Sahaba. You know, with us, our, our memory becomes weaker and weaker due to technology. Have you ever thought of that? Technology has made us lazy. 20 years ago, I knew the numbers of a minimum of 200 people with their names and phone numbers off by heart. And I'm sure a lot of you did. Uh, what's this auntie's number? You say, oh, 256-3384. No, don't try dialing that. I'm just giving it over. <laughs> and they tell you your brother's number, you know it. Your neighbor's number, you know it. Today, I don't know my own wife's number. <laughs> Why? Because it's just a name on the phone. You just click. So technology has made us lazy. That time they had memories. So they memorized it. They knew it. They knew exactly what it was. And what happened? When, some, when there were battles later on, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had instructed some of his companions to write down certain verses and certain things. They were known as Kuttab al-Wahi, Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan. And, uh, there were a lot of them. There were a lot of names. And they used to write some of the verses and so on. They didn't have paper like we have today, mashallah, paper and pen. They used sometimes the skins and sometimes little pieces of wood and sometimes parchments and so on. So... There came a stage when there were some battles where some of those or a number of those who had memorized Quran were martyred. When that happened, there were still, there were still a number who were remaining. So this is when it was decided at that time by Amirul Mu'minin, even Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, it started at his time and it continued to say, let us gather the Quran and put it in, in, in a form to, because we want to preserve it for later on. For example, today you have a phone uh, uh, which has the Quran in it. You have a little uh, app, Quran, and after 200 years, if our children happen to say, not, or let's not say our children, but if the non-Muslims after 200 years happen to say that this Quran is not valid because it took them 1430 years to put it on an iPhone, what are you going to say? <laughs> You will tell them that's such a foolish statement. It's so thick because they had the Quran in a different form before that, in paper form. 
and they just transferred it. If paper is eradicated soon, and they want to do it, they want to eradicate paper and everything, they want to make everything virtual, and you know, you, you will talk and your, your door will reply to you, you will probably see it written on the door, and so it's happening, it's coming. It's, technology is moving in leaps and bounds. You, you, if I told you a few years ago that you will be able to talk to your phone and it will reply, you won't believe it. Today you have the iPhone 4. You talk to it, it replies, and it replies properly. I, I tested it. I tested it with, you know, by trying to insult the phone, and he said, what did it, the woman told me, I don't deserve that. I was shocked. I was shocked. Try it, it works. Well, we, we, we are Muslims, we shouldn't be insulting, but this is a phone. We are just testing it to see if it's really a reality. Wallahi, it will tell you, I didn't deserve that. I asked her, are you married? She says, you don't want to know what you try it and you'll see. <laughs> and I also asked her, are you gay? She says, that is personal. Ah, ah, try it. <laughs> Check it and find out. Allah protect us. This is a phone you're talking to. And this is why sometimes I'm worried because people talk more to their phones than their own wives. <laughs> So if technology has developed and things have gone, there came a time when more people were reading and writing, so they joined the Quran and they put it in writing. But that does not mean what was in the memory of the people was not authentic, because up to today, what is in the memory of the people is still authentic. Allahu Akbar. There is no doubt about it. So if you're a Muslim, you can argue and you can win the argument with an intellectual who has a brain, a secular brain of today, to tell them, we want to tell you that the brains of today, come and see the Muslims. Allah said, we will give you a gift. We will protect the Quran. We are the ones who have revealed this dhikr, this Quran. We will protect it up to today. I'm sure amongst us sitting in this without coming out of this hall today, we can write the whole Quran if we had to sit here. Amongst us, we will find Huffad. So this is what they came with. They, 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 they started to find fault in the Quran because we know it's so authentic. And as I said, one of the biggest issues is the discrepancies that they make in the Quran. And we are sitting here with the Quran, but we've never ever tried to understand the message of Allah. Now I want to read for you a few verses of the Quran where Allah is warning us about those who don't want to read the Quran. Allah says, will they not? Ponder deeply over the verses of the Quran. That's a question for us. In another place, Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Will they not ponder deeply over the verses of the Quran? Or are its locks placed on their hearts? Which means those who don't want to ponder deeply over the verses of the Quran, Perhaps the locks are placed on their hearts. May Allah not make me and not make you and not make us all as Muslimin from amongst those. In another place, Allah says, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyaddabbaru ayatihi wa liyatadhakkara ulul albab. That verse is in Surah Sad, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is a book. That we have revealed to you, anzalnahu ilayk, mubarak, it is blessed, liyaddabbaru ayat, so that they can ponder deeply over its verses. So if someone were to ask you, why was the Quran revealed? You say there is a verse in the Quran which says that Allah revealed the book, it is blessed, in order that they may ponder over its verses. Allah revealed it so that I can ponder over its verses, so that you can ponder over its verses. Who from amongst us has pondered over its verses? Kitabun, it's a clear verse. You find it in Surah Sad. Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka mubarakun liyaddabbaru ayatihi. Those who know Arabic will know liyaddabbaru means in order that they will ponder or they may ponder over its verses. وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ And in order for it to be a reminder to those who have sound intellect. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open those doors for us. When it comes to matters of Islam, we have... Matters of jurisprudence. When we say jurisprudence, how to read salah, how much zakah to give, or exactly who to give that zakah to, and sometimes the exact method of hajj, and sometimes you find certain uh, items of, uh, you know, clothing. If 
or when, when we say jurisprudence, normally we are talking of the Islam of it. Whatever the, when, 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 when I said Islam in a few moments, I told you those things which we can see. Those things which we can actually see with the eye. When it comes to the Islam of it generally, related to jurisprudence, we will take it from the source of the Quran. Then we take it from the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and with that, we try our best to ensure. And you know, even as a layman, it's important for us, yes, we follow this or we follow that. It's important for us to ask ourselves, you see, I am doing this, why am I doing this? I am doing this because Allah has instructed it in the Quran. It is important for us to know that verse. It's not so difficult. Someone tells you, my sister, uh, why do you read salah? You tell them because Allah says in, this, in the Quran, and this is the verse. And you read the verse for them. It's important for you to know that, to try. We are Muslims. If someone were to ask a lawyer that, look, and I'm giving you a real example. If you are to ask a lawyer, can I do this in Malaysia? He'll say, no, because there is a law in that book, this, this, which says in the constitution of Malaysia, that he knows every detail of it. So what about us? We need to get to Jannah. We should be knowing details. We should try our best. And don't think, oh, you know what, what he's saying is so big, so difficult. It's not, we, are, we have our diverse, I go to work from 8 to 5, I am like this. All those are cheap excuses. Just start. They say a mile begins with a step. One step. Take one step. See. Take the next step. See. Wallahi, after 30 years, you'll have covered the mile. Who said you need to cover it today? No one said that, you know, take one step and cover the whole mile in one step. You can't do that. I always, my son is doing hif. And I tell him he, that you are so lucky, you can use an iPod, you know, this iPod, and you can use this memorization of the Quran. You are so, we, when we were young, we had nothing. At a later stage, we had cassettes. Those cassettes, also the tape recorders in the house, between 20 people, we used one. You know what I'm talking about. And it was quite difficult. Today, they're so easy in the car, they have a CD. Here, they have this. They have something that can repeat the verse. And you can repeat the meaning of the verse at the same time. So one day I told him, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting for a day when a little chip, a little chip is made that you plug it into your ear and suddenly you are a hafid? <laughs> he says, yes, that's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> that's what I'm waiting for. MashaAllah. So that can't happen. Well, look, technology is uh, developing, but uh, to my brain, I don't think you can have a chip that suddenly you plug in either your nose or your ear or somewhere, and, or you, you have something that is injected in order to give you the knowledge. I don't think we can be hard drives. <laughs> so an effort is required, but we need to start. Don't be lazy. Start. That look, today we heard something, let me start. And when we start, we will be able to, inshallah, develop. And Allah knows and He will be watching us and He will see us. So we have the Quran, we find out why we are doing things from there. And then we have the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is also very important for us as Muslims to try our best to find out what is the difference. To try our best to find out what is the difference between that which is weak that which is not authentic, there are a lot of narrations which are fabricated. Sometimes you have someone says, this is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, yet it is not. It's not a hadith. Now, the layman might say, how should I know? Well, you know what? You are going to need to learn a little bit. You will have to try and learn a little bit. And let us not get angry or upset when people tell us, you know, uh, this hadith is actually not authentic. You say, but I've heard it all along. That answer is dangerous. You, you need to find out from them to say, you know what? Show me, tell me, teach me, I want to know more. No problem, that is good. But for us to say, this man, everything is wrong with him. Whatever we do is wrong. It's wrong, it's, it's not authentic. Maybe we are following something that might not be authentic. <coughs> like the Quran says, and this is something all communities do not like to hear. They do not like to hear. The Quran says, when you tell people something to correct them, the first line of attack, They will tell you, first line of attack, look, we found our forefathers doing this. So we want to follow them, their guide. Well, I want to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. I want to follow the Messenger. I don't want to die saying, La ilaha illallah, forefathers Rasulullah. <laughs> I want to die saying, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. My forefathers, if they brought me goodness, Alhamdulillah, I accept it. 
if not, I want to tell you traveling around the globe and studying the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, trying to impart the pristine knowledge to the people, we find that people have mixed culture and religion. And they have married the two to the degree that the religion has become a ritual. It is no longer religion. And it's a fact. Let's face it. Let's not become upset when we are told this. Because we have married culture and religion to the degree that religion has become a cultural ritual. You tell someone, why are you doing this? They say, well, you know what? I have to do this. And, and then you have some, someone reading salah in, in a way that you don't even know. And they're doing things that are very, very mixed up. And this is why we are taught to cleanse. What did I say? Our ornament needs to be polished. That's what I said. How will it be polished? With knowledge. Without knowledge, you cannot polish your ornament. It will continue gathering. Ask the sisters here, when you have your home and you have all the dust in your lounge, every day or every second day, you dust it, you dust it. No one sat in your lounge, but you will send the maid or you yourself, you dust it because you don't want the dust to settle. How do you dust it? You make an effort. You take either, you know, nowadays you have a blower or you have something, or you can have a little piece of cloth that you go and wipe things with. Every day or second day or once a week, you will do it regularly because you don't want someone to come into your home and see dust has settled here. You know, you find a, a sheikh coming in with a white robe and he sits. When he leaves your home and he takes his stove out and he's hanging, I won't go to that house again. <laughs> yeah, my whole robe is dirty. Allahu Akbar. So we want, the same way we are bothered about not allowing dust to settle on our ornaments in the house, we have an ornament most important to us, that is our deen. That the only way we can polish it is through knowledge. So don't be shy to learn. Go and learn, learn more. And when we go to learn, we, will, we might find five people, ten people. The numbers don't matter. And the first day it might be a little bit boring. Why? Because shaitan will come to us and say, come on man, is this what it's all about? Wait, knowledge comes with sabr. Knowledge comes with patience. The shaitan will come to you and tell you, no, don't go this week, next week because this week it was boring. And the very following week, there is something very interesting that came about. So you, you need a lot of patience. I have had some brothers who were accepted at the university in Medina, Al Munawwara, and when they went there, after a few days, the brother emails me and says, brother, you know what? I am finding it very boring here. Astaghfirullah. May Allah protect us. Because, why? Because they are learning basics, maybe they know. I said, look, hang on. Once you have got to a level where you now have all the basics that they have taught are, are, are now uh, depleted in your knowledge, you will plug into a new level. Wait with patience because Allah tests you to see, are you worth it or not? If you don't have the patience, what type of knowledge would you like? Then we also have the deeper knowledge of, the, of, of jurisprudence that is derived from the books of fiqh and that is derived from the extraction of rules from the Quran and the Sunnah, that is not everybody's job, but we need to understand that we are fortunate enough to have learned in specific ways and Alhamdulillah. But there is something that needs to be highlighted. And what is that? Belief. The issues of belief they are serious matters. They only have two sources, no third source. A matter of belief. How do I know what to believe? So if it is an issue of jurisprudence, I take it from the Quran or the Sunnah or from what I can term for the layman, fiqh. We're talking of ijma and qiyas. Ijma is consensus and qiyas is certain similarities that are made with certain rules and so on. So for example, if someone comes to ask you, uh, why is, uh, say the name of a drug here, maybe marijuana, you know what it is? Why is that not allowed when it is not in the Quran and not in the Sunnah? So you have to tell them that it is not allowed because of the intoxicating factor in it and because there are other issues which are prohibited due to the intoxicating factor in it because of that being found in this particular item, it is also not allowed. So this is now known as Qiyas. There are certain rules and regulations in its regard. The other day someone asked me a question. Allah safeguard us. You know people want to ask so many questions sometimes and sometimes to ask a question is very good, no problem, very good. You ask a question, you are given the answer. But sometimes it is a defiance, a defiance, you know. And they ask you a question, why is it haram 
for this to happen or that happen. Where in the Quran is it mentioned? And I tell them, it's not in the Quran. So then I'm not going to do that. Well, the Quran leads you to the Sunnah. There are so many other things that are not mentioned in the Quran. I had to actually tell them something which was a little bit below the belt in order for them to understand. I said, brother, the Quran doesn't say that you are not allowed to drink your urination. Oh, that's a very bad word. How can you say that? I said, just to fix you up. <laughs> to fix you up. Don't come and ask me, what, where is it in the Quran? The brother says, where in the Quran does it say that men and women are not allowed to sit together? So now there are verses about lowering the gaze. There are verses about the, the deed. There are so many verses which are far deeper than that. We understand it far deeper than that. So it's like, for example, someone says, where in the Quran does it say that I'm not allowed to beat up my father? Well, the Quran says, لا تقل لهما أفن. Don't even say oof to them. So if you are not allowed to say oof, how can you beat them? So someone says, no, I won't say oof, but I'll beat him. <laughs> that is foolish. It is, it is of greater importance. Allah didn't even discuss that because it's included in here. And it's common knowledge. So you know, some of these matters people don't understand. However, when it comes to belief, who is Allah? Who is the Rasul? What are the qualities of Allah? The names of Allah? What do we believe about Allah? About His Messenger? What do we believe about the final day? What do we believe about the angels? What, what belief do we have about the last day and so on? About Qadr, Taqdeer. You know what is Taqdeer? Fate, good and bad. That we can only take from the Quran and Sunnah. No one else's brain can be applied to those matters because they are matters of belief. We stop where the Quran stopped. We stop where the Sunnah stopped. And we want to look for the authentic hadith. And more than that, we will say Allah knows best. We don't need to know. Like sometimes people come and they ask you things of the unseen. That you know. Uh, let me give you some examples. Firstly, we start with some light examples. People ask you, you see the dog is mentioned in the Quran of Banu Israel. You know. So what color was it? You know. Okay, what color was it? Uh, was it an Alsatian? Or was it a, 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 a Labrador? Or was it a Doberman? You know, these are names of dogs. Say, what's the story? We don't know. Why don't we know? We are Muslims. <laughs> Come on. Allah is not going to ask you before you enter Jannah, quickly tell me what was that dog? <laughs> nothing like that. It's nothing. You don't need to know that knowledge. You don't need to know it. To be honest, we don't fight about it. The people of the book, some of the Jewish people have divided into two groups because of the color of that dog. Some, Wallahi, I'm not joking. Because of the color of the dog, of the cave. Divided into two groups. Some said it was dark in color, light in color. Come on, man. Come on. It's just a lesson to be learned. So these type of things of the unseen, we don't even need to know. Why am I saying this? Because man sometimes wants to know more than what Allah has told him. More than what Allah has told him. And he, in his quest to get to that, he starts doing wrong things. So now you have a sheikh who comes... Uh, we had one sheikh who came, visited us uh, some years ago, and he said, he was talking of Mawlid al-Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he said, you know what? The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was born, you know, Jibreel came to his mother and told her, now this is a lie, this is a lie, because Jibreel, alayhi salatu wa sallam, comes with revelation to prophets. Jibreel told her, that you know, your son is going to be a prophet, be careful, and so on. No, they, they only knew of prophethood later on. They, there were some signs, but they were not as direct as this. So then he continued, and the people in the masjid are crying. And I'm looking, this was a few years ago, and I'm sitting watching people crying. And I said, but look, this man is telling a lie. And I know that he's lying. Then he continued to say, you know, uh, all the things around the way he was born in Mecca. Now look what he said. He was born where the library is you know today there is a library there if you have seen it he was born where the library is so all the things around him they made sajda to him in order to acknowledge his high level because uh, Allah ordered all those things which were around Adam alayhi salam to prostrate to him in order to acknowledge his high level. So the same happened to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is higher than Adam. We believe he's higher than Adam, yes, alayhi salatu wasalam. But we, we cannot start lying to, to, to give him value. His value is there without lies. So don't lie. And if we don't lie, it does not mean we don't respect him. We respect him the most. We love him the most. Loving him means to follow him. 
That's what he says. Loving Allah means to follow the messenger. If Allah wanted, or if Muhammad ﷺ wanted, he could have said, if you love Allah, then you know what? You should worship me. He didn't say that, not at all. If you love Allah, follow the way. I'll show you how to get to him. So this Imam, this Sheikh continued and he said, the, the, the Kaaba came up and went down into, into prostration and the people are crying, Subhanallah. I heard some people say, Allahu Akbar. And I'm just sitting there. And after a while he said, the maqam, you know the maqam, to, today you have a golden little, uh, like a uh, small enclosure where there is maqam. At that time it was not like that. It's just a piece of, it's just a piece of stone at the time, a piece of stone. So he said the maqam went up and prostrated. And I'm thinking, hang on, that maqam is built by these people now, this government of just a few years ago. Okay, no problem. Then he said, the imam, sorry, the minara of the haram, they went up and they prostrated to him. I wanted to say, what about the books in the library? <laughs> Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. <coughs> Brother, these minaras were built by the Turks. Later on, they were renovated by the Saudis. They were not even there. They were not even there. Now look. People are saying Allahu Akbar and crying and they are really crying because why? Their Iman is weak. They, they don't realize that your belief, you must get it from Quran and Sunnah, don't get it from anywhere else. How can we start believing things which are from outside? They are lying to us and the masses are thinking that this is the truth. So this is why they start, people are thinking the minaras went down and they are relating the story to their families. You know, when the Prophet ﷺ was born, it was such miraculous that even the minaras went down. My brother, my sister, there was no even mataf at the time which was proper. It was a small little place and the houses were right there. And the Kaaba was not as it is today, how it is covered in such a beautiful way. It was there, but it was built slightly uh, with, with other bricks. They have renovated it subsequently and so on. Several times in history they have changed it after Muhammad sallallahu time. And then there was another one, a very, very serious one. They, I, I read in one book of one sheikh, he says that, oh, when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was passing away, now he, rahmatullahi alayhi, he was, he was a great Amir. He, they, they, he is counted as Khamis ul Khulafa. He is counted as, one, as the fifth of the Khulafa, although he, his tenure of rule was between 99 Hijri and 101 Hijri. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he was a very strong man. So they said, when Umar ibn Abdul Aziz uh, passed away, uh, on his deathbed, the people were saying, this man is so powerful, he must be buried under the green dome. Are you listening to the statement? This man is so powerful, he must be buried under the green dome. So Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said, no, 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 no. I cannot be buried under the green dome because there, there, there are people far higher than me who are there. I want to be buried with the rest of the Muslims. Now, they are trying to show you the humbleness of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. How do you know it's a lie? Who can tell me? How do you know they are lying? Who can tell me? There was no dome. The dome came, the Turks built the dome. Today when we think of Medina, every one of us, myself included, we think a green dome. That is to us is Medina. MashaAllah, yes it is. It's Medina. But have you thought that this green dome is Turkish heritage? It was built by the Turks, the Ottomans. The domes came in with the Ottomans. So for people to tell us, we need small knowledge. We need basic knowledge to know that this is a lie. And now when you tell someone, brother, that's a lie, they say, no, 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 I don't know what Islam you have come with. You know, you have been spoiled. You don't know, you don't respect the dome. It's not like we don't respect. What do you mean what Islam I came with? We are telling you common sense. And you, so this is why we say we need to polish our ornament. So when it comes to difference of opinion in jurisprudence, it is more acceptable. When it comes to difference of opinion in belief, how could we be different? How could we be different when we take it from Quran and Sunnah alone? There is no difference. If someone were to say regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask you questions about your own maker, we all have the same answers. And this is why you have all the anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their sharias were different. But their beliefs were all the same. I mentioned it the other day in my talk. Every prophet taught 
these pillars. They taught about Allah alone. They taught about all the messengers. They taught about the previous books. They taught about believing in, uh, believing in the fact that good and bad faith came from Allah. They taught about resurrection, including Jesus, may peace be upon him. They taught all these pillars. So this is why when we say the difference of opinion, we need to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us. But sometimes we are too lazy to take from that blessing. And that is the blessing of knowledge. Ask them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are those who know and those who don't know equal? They are definitely not equal. And knowledge is not copyrighted to anyone. The knowledge of deen is not copyrighted to anyone. So much so, that the hadith speaks about the sin of kitmanul ilm. The sin of hiding knowledge. If someone has hidden the knowledge, you know something and you don't share it. There is a sin. Today I am speaking to my brothers and sisters. I hope we have the ability to digest what I have said. Because if you notice today, it was not an ordinary lecture. It was more of a lesson. It was more of a lesson where we are talking about belief and we are talking about differences of opinion and I tried to make it as close as possible to a lecture so that people do not get tired, mashallah. You know, normally when people are captivated and looking at you, you, you can continue. But if sometimes you speak in a lesson in a lecture theater, half the students are asleep. <laughs> so we thank Allah and really I thank uh, the organizers of this particular venue, uh, Brother Farid, the others, all those who have been uh, part and parcel of uh, bringing me along here to Malaysia really tribute is paid to all of them alhamdulillah and uh, we work as a team in order to get together in the plains of paradise inshallah as a team if anyone has questions you may start putting them forward inshallah I will try to respond normally uh, I'm very fearful of answering questions because people try to test you sometimes so we, we when we ask questions we should ask something we really need to know and another thing people have a habit of doing is when they want to fix someone, they, they ask the sheikh in their presence. And then when the sheikh gives the answer, they all look and say, you see, you see, you see, which means, wasn't I telling you? A very good question uh, regarding the Quran, where do we start? Do we start with the meaning and the understanding or the tajweed? Uh, or should you take it together? So someone says, I found it quite difficult. My beloved brothers and sisters, firstly, we should know our duty towards the Quran. We should be able to, we should try to read it. L listen to the duties towards the Quran. We should try to read it. And we should try to read it correctly. And we should try to understand it. So all these are our duties towards the Quran. And we put it into practice as well. And wherever you do not understand something or it sounds ambiguous, like you will come in the Quran, you find a verse which says, uh, Oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they are asking you about alcohol and gambling. Tell them that there is a great sin in it, but there is also some goodness in it. But the sin is far greater. The sin is far greater than the goodness. So someone might read it and say, you see, you can drink a little bit of wine. <laughs> someone might. So if we know as Muslims that alcohol is haram, if we don't understand that or the, and we don't understand abrogation, we need to sit with someone and ask them, look, Ustad, explain to me abrogation. And I want to know the details of this verse. Once that happens, you will learn the knowledge. So do not answer questions that come to your mind yourself to say and jump to a conclusion without knowledge. This is what we are saying. So we do have the duty of reading and understanding and putting it into practice. Whichever one is easiest for you, you start with it, but do not say that I'm not going to do the others. I've done one and I'm not doing the others. Knowing that to understand its meaning is of vital importance. So, you know, the hadith speaks about a reward for every letter that you read in the Arabic language. There is also a reward quite similar for trying to understand it. And trying to understand it, wallahi, ah, I don't know how strongly we can put it. There, is no, there are no words to explain to you what it will do to you and your life. To know what your own maker has sent to you. I think it's an insult, to be honest, to have read thousands of books 
in, in order uh, to understand the world more properly and we couldn't even read one book to, uh, that our own maker who gave me five fingers and my identity uh, the identity every thumbprint is different the one who did that for me i don't want to listen or read his message seriously may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us start with whatever is best as for tajweed it is our duty to slowly try and improve that and to do something about it so all these three things like someone tells you do i need english or maths you need both of them simple maths you need and simple english you will also need uh, it's just an example so uh, to, in order to answer that we need all inshallah and we start with whatever is easiest for us and we will try our best also uh, to inshallah incorporate the rest is it okay to read the translation of the quran more than reciting it as we are not arab speaking people that's a very interesting question to be honest with you personally my view is that it is very important to read the arabic language and to recite the quran and to try your best but if a person cannot read the arabic language then it does not give them an excuse to leave the quran on one side they must read the english of it they must read the english of it let me quickly explain to you why we need the arabic we are not allowed to read salah in any language besides Arabic. So some of the non-Muslims say, you Muslims are strange. How can you only pray in Arabic? And we tell them, no, your prayer is different from ours. Your prayer is more of a supplication. If you tell a Christian pray, they'll clasp their hands and they'll start saying, oh God, do this and oh God, that and thank you, oh God and almighty God and so on. That's what that's prayer to them. To us, that is dua. It's a supplication. Dua, can, is there any specific language for a dua? Even if you don't know what to say, you say, Ya Allah, you read my heart, you know what's inside. <laughs> for us, it's enough. For us, it's enough. Ya Allah, you know better than me what I want to ask you, Ya Allah. So, Ya Allah, give it to me. I don't know how to word it, Ya Allah. Allah. Allah doesn't mind. So, you don't need a language for dua. They must not come and con you and say your prayer is in Arabic. So, what is the salah? Salah has so much benefit. One of them is the protection of the book allahu akbar i tell the reverts when they say it's going to be difficult to learn the arabic i say don't worry you only need to know a bare minimum of a few short chapters to read your salah to start with and slowly you will be able to develop and when they say but why i say look where is the bible they say it's lost where is the talmud torah they say it has been changed so the quran it didn't change why because you have contributed every one of you have contributed towards the protection of the quran all of you without exception by doing what you know surah al-fatiha you know another two three surahs you know a little bit more so if you if you go to your sister's house one day and she says alhamdulillahi rabbil alamun what will you say what will you say every one of you you are not a hafiz of the quran you are not a hafiz but you will say alameen am i right Allahu Akbar. Allah has used all of us. Even though I don't know Arabic, I can tell someone, don't change revelation, please. Do you see? Do you see what we are saying? Look at the power of it. So we must be happy to say, my salah, I will learn the Quran and I would try to have the meaning of it because it will add flavor to my salah and I will get the true essence of it. But even if I don't know the meaning, I'm going to learn the Arabic because I need to read my salah. There we are. But what I'm saying is it is our duty to understand it primarily because primarily we must understand it. So let's not divorce the recitation at the expense of trying to just understand, but we must understand it more importantly. And we need to know at least a minimum when it comes to recitation. Also, we can uh, read the meaning of it and recite a, a portion of it on a daily basis recite a portion of it on a daily basis and read the meaning of a portion of it you might move slower when it comes to recitation because you are a little bit slower you set aside 10 minutes a day for recitation and you might try slowly slowly you might read two verses some people in 10 minutes can read five pages and then you might read the english of it you might just read two verses and your pondering over it will be so deep that it will take you the whole day so it all depends may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us This is a very interesting question. I, it says in Malaysia, the Muslims add another title to the name of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam. What is it? Baginda. 
Baginda. Baginda. Sayyidina. The title given to the ruler. I think the word here used is the title given to the ruler, Baginda. So uh, it's a title given to the Malay rulers. Do you think it is a bid'ah to call them that? Uh, you see, one thing is we respect the Prophet and in order to honor him, those who honored him the most, those who honored him the most were the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. They gave the greatest honor. They were chosen. I, I want to tell you why they were chosen. They were chosen to be Sahaba because of the condition of their heart. They were the most ready to surrender. When they were drinking alcohol and the verse came, they spat it out. That's the type of people. When they were doing something, they immediately fell prostrate. When the Prophet ﷺ told them, don't do this, they left everything of that nature within split moments. They did not say how and why. Imagine today if someone tells you, you know, uh, to, have, uh, to eat interest is haram, for example. People will say, ah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I, you know, there is an issue regarding this and so on. So other condition of our hearts are such that we are not prepared to surrender immediately. We start looking at how difficult our life will be if we took that out of our lives. So for that reason, we are not Sahaba. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding of the level of Sahaba. When they were told this is haram, they threw it straight out. When they were told make hijrah, they left their families, they left their wealth, they left everything and they ran. When they were told, hey, we need to run this way, they ran that way. They didn't ask why. After they did it, they found out. <laughs> so they respected the Prophet ﷺ, they honored him, they gave their lives for him. And they used terms for him. It is best to use the same terms that they used. If it is in another language and it has the same connotation, we would be allowed to use it. But if it is in another language and it does not have the same connotation, then it would be better not to use it. But we don't want to fight about little matters of that nature, inshallah. For as long as we have understood what I've just said now, that what is better for us as Muslimin is to, to, to use the same terms that were used by the Sahaba radiallahu anhum because they were the ones who knew how to respect the Prophet sallallahu in the greatest way. Uh, this is a very interesting question also. It says, how do we address a Muslim who is anti-hadith, for example? Now, a Muslim who is anti-hadith, for your information, Technically speaking, they cannot call themselves a Muslim. Because anti-hadith, uh, this is a new war that people are waging against Islam to remove it. When you remove hadith, you've removed Islam. Because the Quran alone, it has an explanation. You know there is a hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, Ala inni utitul Qur'ana wa mithlahu ma'ahu. Behold, I have been given the Quran, and I have been given something similar to it together with it, which is the Sunnah. يُوشِكُ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ رَجُلٌ جَالِسٌ عَلَىٰ أَرِيكَتِهِ يَقُولُ هَذَا كِتَابُ اللَّهِ مَا وَجَدْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ حَلَالٍ أَحْلَلْنَاهُ وَمَا وَجَدْنَا فِيهِ مِنْ حَرَامٍ حَرَّمْنَاهُ The Prophet says, Be careful, very soon a man will come sitting on his recliner chair. Arika means like a sofa, sitting on a reclining chair, saying, this is the book of Allah. Whatever is in it in halal, I make halal. Whatever is haram in it, I make haram. I don't want to take anything else. The Prophet ﷺ says, be careful of that person. That was a prophecy. It has come. Today we see them. They tell you, what is hadith? There is a lot of dispute in hadith. Just throw it out. Astaghfirullah. How can you say that? When the explanation of so many things is in hadith, Salah is not explained in detail in the Quran, it is in the Sunnah. Zakah is not explained in detail in the Quran, it is in the Sunnah. You know, so many things are, in fact, almost everything, the details of it is in the Sunnah. The Quran is there, it has in it rules and regulations and it guides you. There are verses in the Quran that tell you that you need to follow the Sunnah. Like the one that we just read, if you love Allah, follow me. Follow me meaning my way, my path, my explanation. That is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, what did they do? They followed him, they asked him, he answered. So that question and answer, the copy of it came to us. How can we say it is not valid? When they didn't understand something, they asked him. He answered them. When he answered them, it was recorded for us and it came. Some people say, no, it was only recorded 200 years later. So it's not authentic. It has its chain. It is the only set of historic documentation that comes with a chain of narrators to the source. Today when they tell you about Second World War, what do they say? A man writes a book. 
He's living now, but he writes a book about Second World War. We still believe it and teach it in our schools. And there is no chain of narrators. He could be saying anything. And we just believe it. When they write history, history of Malaysia, history of Zimbabwe, his, who knows that it is authentic? Maybe the colonialists came and just put something. They normally do do that anyway. They're rewriting the history of Iraq as we are talking now. Removing everything that they don't like. They will remove the, the, the presence of Islam in a country and rewrite a book and pretend like it was them who brought the civilization. It has happened. And we look like fools when we say, no, it was the Muslims. They say, where in the books of history is it? But who's, the, the, your history has no chain of narrators. So we can accept their books of history with no chain of narrators. And we cannot accept hadith which has chain of narrators. Well, how foolish can it be? And when we say chain of narrators, Islam is the only religion that has such a comprehensive detailed discussion of all the men who were responsible from the point that the hadith was, was written, going back all the way to its source, whoever narrated it, where they were, who they were, what type of people they were, when they were born, the places they traveled, the teachers they had. You have Asma'ul Rijal, there are books, volumes and volumes of books. And it's so easy. So how can we reject that? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide those who, who are, who are anti-hadith. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them from those who realize and understand that not only do we need the hadith, but we need to authenticate the hadith and it's not difficult. Today, there is a computer program that is out where you punch in hadith, you punch in the hadith, and it gives you all the chain of narrators and it highlights in three colors. There is red, there is green and blue to tell you the level of the narrator. If it is red, it means he, there is something wrong. You can click his name and it will show you 10 books where this man has been mentioned and whether he is a liar or not, or whether he has fabricated in his life or not. So you will now know that this hadith, there is something wrong. I can give you an example. We might have heard a hadith, Utlubul ilma walaw bisseen. Have you heard that hadith? Seek knowledge even if it means to go to China. Have you heard the hadith? Have you heard the hadith? So seek knowledge is a hadith. We don't deny that. Seeking knowledge, that's a hadith. It's mentioned in so many other hadith. But the, the man who was narrating the hadith, he was explaining innocently, saying, you know, seek knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ said, seek knowledge. Now the hadith is over. Now he's explaining to the people to say, even if it means going to China, so what people did, they married the two and pretended like the whole thing was hadith. What about China? The Prophet ﷺ didn't even know the Chinese at the time. <laughs> China. Going to China. It's like you find a hadith which says, seek knowledge even if it means going to KL. So you would know that KL was not there at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So even if it means going to KL is the explanation of the man who is talking. It's not, it's like if I tell you something, I give you a hadith and I explain the Prophet wasallam said that you should read salah in this way. Then I pause for a moment and I start giving my own explanation. You would understand it. So when you write it down, you need to separate the two. So the ulama have separated the two. Today we still find some scholars who might not have deep, you see, knowledge is so deep. You keep on swimming and you keep on learning. I learn new things every day. That is knowledge. And you might have to modify what you've known in the past. You have to change it sometime because you now know something new. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to do it. The Imams of the Madahib used to do it. Imam Shafi has an opinion. Tomorrow he changes it. And people say, why? He says, because I found something which now authenticates, which now authenticates a certain view and it will eradicate my previous view. He, you, you find that. It's not embarrassing to do that. We should, in fact, when we find we are doing wrong, we should change it. So, so now... There are some ulama who might not know that walaw bisseen, meaning even if it means going to China, that addition is actually the explanation of the rawi, it is the explanation of the narrator and not the word of the prophet. They might not know that and they will quote the hadith in the masjid and so on. But once you get to a certain level, and now I told you we have, we have software that is developed. There is, a, there is a website in Arabic, sadly it's all in Arabic language, it will come inshallah in Malaya and everything else as time passes inshallah. But in the Arabic language there is even a website, you just paste the hadith and it gives you all the information about the hadith. It will show you in which books it is, who are the narrators, what is the quality of each narrator. Subhanallah, it is so easy to learn knowledge these days, it's at your fingertips mashallah. I see some, some people with their phones. 
and they are so busy and I think mashallah I hope they are using Quran something they are playing poker on the phone <laughs> they are playing poker on the phone and they are playing games say I cracked it I cracked it did you crack a hadith or did you crack something else so I think in the day we can learn one hadith there's no harm and if someone says this narration is fabricated don't get angry there might be another narration similar to it which is more correct because fabrication can either be a chain or it can either be the wording and sometimes they can be something similar in meaning but with a different wording which is more valid than a certain wording some people like to make things rhyme you know to make things rhyme so those who are anti hadith really uh, it is very difficult because uh, they, they, they have lost the path and we need to make dua for them and try and speak to them and explain to them uh, I have the questions here most of the people have put in their emails so if perhaps maybe we be, might be able to respond a little bit more. Uh, one other question says here, a question about qada and qadar, taqdeer. Allah says, لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ وَلَا تَفْرَحُوا بِمَا آتَاكُمْ One of the reasons why Allah has predestined matters is that you do not become so depressed regarding that which you have lost. And you do not become so proud and haughty and arrogant regarding that which you have gained. So Allah has decreed it. Be happy with the taqdeer. I was reading a hadith very recently of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wherein he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tests everyone. Whoever is happy with the test of Allah, Allah is happy with them. Whoever is upset with the test of Allah, Allah is upset with them. We can't be upset with the test of Allah. Allah puts tests in our lives. Don't be angry. Don't be upset. You know, we read this book, Riyadh al-Salihin. It's a good book of hadith. Gardens of the Virtuous. Good book of hadith. If you read those ahadith day by day, you will come across so many good, authentic ahadith in that book. If you don't understand the hadith, go and ask. Don't just come to your own conclusion and confuse yourself. Ask those with knowledge. It's important to have link with those with knowledge. Because today, technology is at our fingertips. You read on your own. You hear on your own. If you've heard something that doesn't make sense to you or that your mind has not yet digested or you think, hey, there's something that's a little bit murky here, go and ask. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. This question is very broad regarding qada wa qadar. I don't know what the sister wants, whether she actually wants us to uh, explain further and so on. I have just told you in a nutshell. People must not blame taqdeer when they do something wrong. At the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, and this is written in a book called Tariq al-Khulafa, where they came with a thief, a thief. They brought him to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, and he was about to have his hand cut. For your information, Islam and Sharia is very, very deep. It is not shallow. Sharia is not barbaric law. It is the solution to mankind's problems. The rape and the sexual harassment, everything, if you follow Islam and its dress code and so on, problem solved. If they tell you that in Malaysia nowadays in some of the public trains they have changed the color of the, some of the, 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 the seats to make the girls sit on the pink chairs and so on because of sexual harassment and what have you, perhaps it is because of the way they dress. When you dress Islamically there is greater respect and when you handle yourself like a Muslim, Sometimes you dress Islamically, but you handle yourself like a person who's, you know, doesn't be flirting here and there and giggling with this one and that one. Doesn't work. You need to handle yourself in a respectable manner and people will respect you. So if that happens, it's because they haven't had the Sharia to be applied properly in our own lives. And this is why we say, when we say cutting the hand, do you know how difficult it is to arrive at, at a judgment to cut someone's hand. You need a certain type of witness. You need the witnesses to be of a certain level of truthfulness. You need an item that was stolen to be more than the value of a certain amount. You need it to have been in what is known as hirz. A hirz means a place that is considered secure for that item. So if I have my vehicle with the doors open and the windows down, I cannot cut the hand of the person who has stolen it because I invited him as well. But if it is, yes, I am guilty. If my money is sticking out of my back pocket and someone steals it, his hand cannot be cut. We are talking of someone who has stolen a specific, more than a certain amount from a place considered to be safe for that item, who was witnessed with witnesses who are truthful people beyond a certain degree, and so on. After that, there will be judgment. If there is one small doubt, you won't cut the hand, you punish him in a different way. You know... The courts of today, they oppress people with a certain law. 
What is the law? Beyond reasonable doubt. That reasonable doubt is not in Islam. Islam says beyond doubt. Finished. It's over. If there is any doubt, you don't cut the hand. If there is any doubt, you don't execute. If there is any doubt, you don't. It is called shubha. Al hududu tandari'u aw tandafi'u bi shubuhat. All these, all these punishments of, of that height where you execute or you have the cutting of the hand or you have the lashing and so on, they will drop immediately upon the slightest doubt. Slightest doubt. Whereas the, 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 the courts, the secular courts, that doesn't happen. They just say reasonable doubt. Reasonable. That means uh, the, 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 there is some doubt, but you know what? The judge still believes that this person is guilty. They go to the gallows. Allahu Akbar. Allah protect us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. So when the thief came to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, after everything was done and his hand was supposed to be cut, he says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Oh, yeah, you are cutting my hand. Don't you believe in taqdeer? It was destined that I was going to steal. <laughs> so how can you punish me for something that was destined for me in my destiny? So Amir al-Mu'mineen calls the Jallad. Jallad is the one who's going to execute that, uh, you know, the, the, the cutting. And he says, get on with your job because it was written in his destiny that he was going to have his hand cut. <laughs> he was going to have his hand cut. Get on with your job. So. What does that mean? Don't use predestiny to, 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 to be act as an excuse for what you have done. When you committed the crime, you committed it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all forms of goodness. Yeah, there is a question. Can a person pray for a, for a non-believer who is ill? Meaning you're asking Allah to cure them. You ask Allah to cure them. You need to add something with that. May Allah guide them. So guidance is the biggest cure. You see, when you have people who are... Uh, sick and ill, when someone, when a non-Muslim passes away, we are taught as Muslimin that we do not make dua of maghfirah for them, we do not make dua of forgiveness for them, we can sympathize and we can express our condolences and it stops there. And th there are reasons, I explained it a few days ago, I explained it a few days ago. Uh, when it comes to a person who is sick, you can say, Ya Allah, cure this person. You, you are allowed to make dua for the cure of a non-Muslim, but add something to that and say, Ya Allah, cure them and guide them because in the same way they might be injured or sick physically, they may be injured or they are injured and sick spiritually. Don't forget the one without the other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all cure from our sicknesses and guide us all as well. Uh, how will a person know? I think I will end with this question because there are, there's, you know, there are a lot of time, inshallah, that we have taken talking. How will a person know whether he or she is a mu'min? Well, you will know it through the condition of your heart. If you believe thoroughly in, in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down and the tenets of Iman and, and Islam and so on, you believe it in the heart and you will be able to feel that belief in your heart. But the hadith says that Iman has a sweetness. And you will need some qualities to taste the sweetness of Iman. What is, what is that? Three qualities, if they are found in you, you will start tasting the sweetness of Iman. It has a taste in it. If Allah or for Allah and His Messenger to be more beloved to you than anything and anyone else. They are the most important. What pleases Allah pleases me. What the Messenger has come with is my following. So if that is your aim in life, that Allah comes first, then everyone else, you have the chance to taste the sweetness of Iman. That is quality number one. An yakuna Allahu wa rasuluhu ahabba ilayhi mimma siwahuma. For, for the person to love Allah and His Messenger more than anyone and everyone else. Everything besides the two of them. And you hibba rajula la yuhibbuhu illa lillah. For you to love someone only for the sake of Allah. We love each other solely because we are mu'mineen. We share. You, you find a person who is pious, you love their piety, you love them for that piety. And you, you have this uh, feeling of respect and at the same time love for this particular person. Solely for the pleasure of Allah. There is nothing that brings you to a person besides the deen and besides Allah. Sometimes we are inclined to someone because we earn money through them. If they are a good Muslim, alhamdulillah. But if they are not, you might compromise your religion one day because you might lose a dollar or two or a ringgit or two. So you have people who are very big enemies of Islam, but you will attend their functions, you will be seen rubbing shoulders with them, and you will... 
if you have to do that for some reason without compromising your deen, it might be one of those things. But you need to know a line and a limit. I have had cases where people have business partners whom they allow to come in their houses yet they are non-Muslim and they have bad habits they allow them to come in their houses and mix with their children and play with their children without a barrier they eat together and they laugh together and they go on holiday together and the one brother told me please warn the people because my son has left Islam why? he fell in love with the girl, the daughter of my business partner and the daughter convinced him that why must I convert? You convert. So he says, Dad, it's fair. Either she comes here or I go there. So I, he says, I didn't even teach my children religion. He doesn't even realize that we have such a, a, a much higher religion and much more authentic. There are thousands of reasons why Islam is more authentic and more valuable. Thousands. We believe in the other messengers as well. And we put them where they belong. Subhanallah. He says, I lost my child to the child of my business partner. The sin I committed was I allowed them in my home without a barrier. They may come. No one's saying no. But you have a barrier. You need to know what is the line. You need to know what is the limit. You can't just have someone sitting and, you know, doing whatever they want and taking, go on holiday with them. How? Subhanallah. These people, they might be the worst of influence. So that is the second thing. And you hibba rajula la yuhibbuhu illa lillah. You will taste iman when you love someone for the pleasure of Allah. And you love each other for the pleasure of Allah. Sometimes when we see a religious person more than us, some of us get upset. We go further, further away. I had some brothers a long time ago, back in Africa. They, they, when they saw me, they kept their distance. Until some time later, brother came and told me, you know what, I should have come to you two years ago. I said, but why didn't you? He said, your beard stopped me. <laughs> you know, when you see a beard, you don't want to walk with them. I, I met someone at the airport once, he quickly greeted me and ran away. I said, hey, don't worry, they won't lock you up, man. He says, no, I don't want to, you know, it's okay, sorry, just understand me. Okay, we understand. So, it doesn't mean anything. Those people who are claimed to be the ones who perpetrated the injustices, uh, whether it was September 11 or what have you, none of them had beards, according to the diagrams we saw. Not one. None of them. Uh, did you see any one of them having a beard from the 19, the photos they showed? No, I don't think, not even one. So, please, remember, we are much calmer and cooler, inshallah. <laughs> Why I'm saying this is because you, you should love someone who is trying to please Allah and they are on a higher level than you. You know, you see a woman and mashallah, the women are well dressed with, the, you know, with their hair covered and so on. If someone is gone to a higher level and they have chosen to cover their face, support them. They have chosen to cover their face, support them. Love them to say, this woman is stronger than me. Alhamdulillah. We don't have to say, no, that's not Islam. These people are being oppressed. These people are this and that. Why? The hadith says you want to taste the sweetness of Iman. Start learning to love those who are higher than you in your religion. And start learning to love those not only higher than you, but those who are trying to earn the pleasure of the Almighty. Love them. When you go to the masjid and you see someone reading salah and he's trying to concentrate, and you just enter and say, mashallah, ya Allah, accept his salah. What a man. We love this person for the pleasure of Allah. They are trying. So, and the third condition is very important for all of us. I told you three things for halawat al-iman, to taste the sweetness of iman. An yakraha an ya'uda ila al-kufr kama yakrahu an yulqa fi nar A person must hate to go back to disbelief in the same way they hate to go back, in the same way they hate to be thrown into hellfire. What does this mean? This means a person should hate to go back on their religious achievements in the same way they hate to be thrown in hellfire. When you have achieved religiously, don't step backwards. If you did not used to read salah and you started reading and you are now reading three salah a day, don't go back to two, go to four. And from four, go to five. If you are now reading five salah a day, don't ever go backwards. If you did not cover your hair before and now you started covering your hair, don't uncover it now. Don't go backwards. If you don't go backwards and you're only moving forward one after the other, after the other, after the other, there will come a time when you taste the sweetness of Iman. I'm moving forward. I'm not going backwards. For example, the, the men folk, if you have left a sin for the sake of Allah, don't go back to it after that. You must hate to go back to your 
previous ways which are in the displeasure of Allah, in the same way you would hate to go back or to be thrown into hellfire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us from these qualities. I have had uh, a beautiful two hours. I think it's been two hours almost. And uh, we really uh, thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us this opportunity. For your information, I was telling Brother Farid when I was coming here, I said, you know, I'm not feeling well. And you know, I haven't really slept much. And you know, I have been taxed quite a bit. And I was complaining to him, I came here and I don't know where it went. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on us all. And may Allah accept this little effort of ours. And I hope and pray we can take a chapter from what I've said today. There is much more. We cannot learn the whole deen in one hour, two hours. It requires a whole lifetime. May we be dedicated and may we benefit, inshallah, from all those ulama in our midst who are doing a sterling job. Allah accept it from all of us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. When you feel all alone in this world And there's nobody to count your tears Just remember no matter where you are Allah knows Allah knows When you're carrying a monster load And you wonder how far you can go With every step on that road that you take Allah knows No matter what inside or out There's one thing of which there's no doubt Allah knows Allah knows And whatever lies in the heavens and the heavens Every star in this whole universe Allah knows Allah knows When you find that special 